Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. My name is Reed Miller, and I am your president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. Well, it's a new week. We've had a new billionaire travel to space. Sure, these billionaires have been uh, in a rocket measuring contest for quite some time now. I'm not sure about you, but I find space travel and exploration fascinating. It brings with it the hope of endless new possibilities, the opportunity to change lives and all of mankind. Which brings me to Rotary International's theme for this year. As I mentioned last week, the year's theme is serve to change lives. It's a simple theme, but I love it. It's an easy reminder of what we signed up for. When we signed up to be Rotarians, we are here to serve, to change lives. Let's focus on that. Let's get fired up about it. The more effort we make, the more lives we can change. It's important to remember when we're presented with an opportunity to serve on a committee, a board, or to help with a service project, those are opportunities to change lives. Not all of us can go to space, but I promise you that all of us have the opportunity to change lives. All right, let's get to our reflection. Everybody, please welcome Rotarian Jim Flood to give our weekly reflection. Thank you, President Reed, and I'm happy to do it. In fact, about 20 years ago, I was assigned to the committee to do the invocations and to sign people up for it. Um, and that was uh, one of the only directives I've got at the time was, can you make them a little shorter? because about three weeks earlier, somebody had done the Charge of the Light Brigade in its entirety, and you know, that caused some consternation about time. Um, in the interest of that, um, I'm gonna try again to make this pretty short. Uh, one of the big things that I think we need to do because of this pandemic is to reach out to fellow Rotarians that you haven't seen at this meeting or even when Reed had the in-person meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, reach out to them, invite them to that first meeting uh, back in uh, the hotel when we have that in August. And I think that that's a great start for us to get going. Um, we have plenty of opportunities to do things and I'm personally involved with Wheels of Power and uh, Meals on Wheels. Um, and these are great programs and we do them as Rotarians because we can and also because we know we should. Back to you, President Reed. All right, thank you so much, Jim. And if any of you would be willing to volunteer to give a weekly reflection, Siobhan, thank you. She has put the link in the chat or you can email Siobhan directly. Now I'd like to ask any Rotarians who have invited a guest to raise their hand and Carol will call on you to unmute and introduce your guest. Or if you have a guest who came on your own, or if you are a guest who came on your own, please raise your hand and introduce yourself or say hi in the chat box. Any guests going once? I don't see any, Reed. Okay, thank you, Carol. If anybody pops up, feel free to let me know. We'd be happy to uh, welcome them to our program. Alrighty, and now I would like to extend a happy anniversary to everyone who joined Rotary Club of Portland in July. We alternate each week honoring birthdays and Rotary anniversaries for the month. Please note the names of these anniversary people and reach out to one of them with a call or an email since keeping up our membership during this challenging time is more important than ever. Happy anniversary to all of you. All right, now please welcome Rotarian Dan Bramski to announce an upcoming donation drive. Dan, are you with us? I don't see Dan here. I also don't see Dan. We'll give him an opportunity later on in the program if he's able to make it. Okay, next up, we'll move right along. Welcome to our Vice President, Rotarian Maria Schell, to tell us about a couple of upcoming events we have. Thank you so much, President Reed. And um, hello to Camila, her second Rotary meeting. Everybody sees Kurt and his cute little baby girl right there. So I just, I'm smiling ear to ear. And so I'll try to remember these dates that I need to share with all of you. Um, two exciting opportunities. One is, 
for those of you who remember when you first joined the Rotary Club of Portland, you went to some type of introduction training. For those of us who've joined in the last kind of 15, 20 years, we called it gearing up. And what we're looking for today is for more people to get trained up to be leaders for future gearing up sessions for our new members. So we have made it more streamlined as somebody joins the Rotary Club. Every second Tuesday, we host gearing up so they can come meet with other new members and get their training. But what we'd like is to have more than just a handful of us actually go out and give those gearing up trainings. So if you are interested in signing up to come and get trained to be a gearing up potential leader, join us on August 10th or August 17th at 10 a.m. If you're interested, just shoot Corinne or anybody here in the chat. You could just say, hey, I'd like to come to one of those and we'll make sure we are ready for you. And I'm giving this announcement on behalf of Terry Goldman, who's our membership chair this year, uh, because he's out of, um, out of the office this week. So please join us on August 10th or the 17th at 10 a.m. if you are interested in just getting into the pool of people who can host our future gearing up sessions. And my second announcement for everybody is, I am sure it's on your calendar, but we have started now quarterly the opportunity to welcome our newest Rotarians. So Rotarians who've joined in the last 18 months have gotten a special invitation to join for a, a happy hour social, but I also extend it to any and all of you. If you would like to come, it's been in the spokes. It's gonna be tomorrow afternoon and get ready it's in person. We're so excited. It's going to be in person outdoors at the Loyal Legion in Southeast Portland. We picked it because there's a lot more parking over there. Uh, so join us at 430. We already have quite a few new Rotarians, some who even just submitted their application will be joining us. But for all of you who have not joined in the last 18 months, come and welcome them and get to know some of our newest members or just come grab a beer at a place that has like 100 things on tap. So Loyal Legion tomorrow at 4.30. Thank you so much. Back to you, Reed. All right. Thank you so much, Maria. That sounds like a great time. What a great opportunity to meet our new members and for our new members to meet all of us and get a little bit better associated with our club. Okay, now we are going to take a quick break to chat with our fellow Rotarians. In a moment, we will be split into smaller groups for a virtual table talk for about 10 minutes. Please be sure to introduce yourselves to the others in your group. You are welcome to chat freely, but you, if you need a topic of discussion, the Olympics are scheduled to kick off this week. So let's discuss what about the Olympics gets you excited or doesn't. And here we go. And now it is time to hear from our keynote speaker of the week. After our speaker has finished, please feel free to ask any questions. Carol, thanks again. We'll be monitoring the Q&A through our chat box. Now, please welcome our past president, Rotarian, Dr. Chris Acterman, as today's chair of the day. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Dang. Joe is the uh, leader of the uh, ECMO program at Emanuel Hospital. Um, many of you may know that I spent most of my career as a member of the staff at Emanuel and was around when we started using ECMO for various applications. Uh, ECMO, for those of you who aren't aware, is extracorporeal oxygenation. So it's a way of putting oxygen into your blood without using your lungs. Uh, Joe is a physician. He's an anesthesiologist and a member of the Oregon Anesthesia Group. And he uh, was challenged with being able to use ECMO uh, to uh, treat COVID patients and put together a team to accomplish that with the unique challenge of not only having to use ECMO, which is complicated enough, but having to use ECMO on highly contagious patients and do it in a way that was safe both for the patient uh, and the staff. So without further ado, here's Joe Dang to tell us the story of ECMO and COVID at Emanuel Hospital. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. That was a great introduction. I'm going to share the screen. Um, I'd like to say for those who are joining us a little later, if there are images that you find uh, not okay uh, because of guests in the room, please just send a chat to me and I'll race through them, okay? Or raise your hand. Here it goes. All right, 
Um, Corinne, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Great. So thanks very much. Um, my name is uh, Joe Dang, and uh, I am the director of the ECMO program at Legacy Emanuel. You may know ECMO also as ECLS. It basically stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, oxygenating your blood outside your body. Okay. Um, I'm going to give an overview of my talk. Basically, I'm going to talk about who I am and who we are as a program, our history a little bit. Uh, some of you may actually remember when we started our first case um, and show a few pictures, diagrams mainly of how the, the machine works to help people, show you where we've been in our, on our transport team. So we actually take most of our show on the road. Uh, we don't just do it at home, we actually are mobile. Um, and then I'm going to move into some more graphic pictures of patients. These have all been uh, cleared by legal and ethics and all those important people. And then I'll show you sort of uh, uh, a little bit more medical data about what we do. And then um, I'll introduce you to some of our survivors over the years. And then we'll open it up for questions. And hopefully, um, if, if I start running um, short on time, if someone can give me a gentle Zoom tap, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, I understand uh, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Is that right? Okay. All right. There, so some disclosures. Um, I do sit on the board of an insurance company um, that insures physicians and hospitals. Um, we deal with uh, quality improvement and risk management. And I will be discussing what we doctors call the off-label use of medical devices. So the ECMO machine is only FDA approved to be on a patient for six hours. We have had patients on it for three months. So that is a little bit off-label. And as Dr. Ackerman will tell you, we do a lot of things off-label and this is one of them. So our story is it starts in 1985. Um, there was a company uh, named Bard that invented a thing called the CPS machine. It is called bypass in a box. Ex excuse the typo there. Um, it essentially takes an enormous cardiopulmonary bypass machine and puts it so that it's portable. Um, in that era, patients still had to have a blood thinner running through their arteries and veins in order to be on this machine because you would not want the tubing to clot if you were dependent on this machine for life. A clot would stop the machine. The problem is if you're bleeding, you won't want to have a blood thinner either. So it limited the use and application of this. Okay, and so most of our cases, and they were few, um, dealt with hypothermia and people who had had massive heart attacks who happened to be nearby. So we had 54 patients in that first five years. Um, from 1990 to 2009, um, there was invented a special coating on the inside of the tubing, meaning we did not have to use blood thinners as much. And in that era, we were able to save a few trauma patients, people who were bleeding, who had organ failure, their lungs did not work. Sometimes their lungs and their heart did not work and they needed to get somewhere to get fixed. Um, so that different doctors can work on them and they had a chance to heal. And so we had 46 patients and that was a 19 year span. So it was hard to use. Uh, and also because EMS had really developed during that time. And so a lot of times our team did not have to go out to get a trauma patient. Um, the local ambulance companies and Life Flight were able to bring them to the major medical centers. So that was a blessing. Um, 2009 really marks the start of our program. Um, we've had over 300 patients on ECMO since then, and we have the H1N1 flu pandemic to thank for that. Um, new oxygenators were invented that were especially efficient, and we started using something called the VDR ventilator at that time. It's a very old style ventilator that shakes a patient at several hundred times a minute. It's invented by a guy named Dr. Forrest Bird for military use. And we have a lot of experience with this ventilator because it's useful in infants and burn victims. And for those of you who know, we do have a lot of infants at our children's hospital and we are the regional burn center. 
And so it's very useful for people with severe lung injury and we still use it. So over 300 patients. Um, the, so this is the bypass in a box. Um, if this photo looks vintage, it is. This is a, a picture from the original device. And our first case, um, and I, I apologize if this may bring back um, strong feelings for some people, um, I'll try to be quick. Um, even though our program was brought to Oregon by two doctors from California, um, Dr. Jonathan Hill, who is a cardiothoracic surgeon, and Dr. Bill Long, who some of you may know as our, uh, one of our co-founders of the trauma system here, their idea was to use it for trauma. It was actually applied uh, on one of the patients, one of the students from the OES tragedy, uh, where a lot of students were frostbitten. And of the two students who survived, um, one of them came to Emmanuel. They were placed on the CPS device and the patient was rewarmed successfully with no permanent disabilities. In fact, this person is a practicing physician today. Um, unfortunately, the other students and teachers were not able to be saved, but this really proved that this is a viable technology and it could be used. And if, for those who, of you who know, if you're going to put someone on cardiac bypass to rewarm them in the regular way, you have to cut their chest open. It's like a two foot long scar and the ribs have to be split. This is a very, very um, invasive and hard to heal from uh, surgery. And even mini cardiac bypass requires a bunch of incisions. So ECMO actually doesn't require much. It's more invasive than a haircut, but much less than standard cardiac bypass. So um, it's also been used in hypothermia. Um, the, uh, F4 phantom crashes uh, off the coast and uh, our team went out to, uh, uh, to Astoria to, to get the, the patient. Um, he did not survive, but was able to be, um, he got a shot, he got a shot on the ECMO and uh, we brought him back. Here's some older photos of uh, being able to figure out how to have someone on this crazy complicated device with all these staff and still get them to fit inside of a CT scan how to travel with them, how to put them in a van and drive around. Um, these are not easy problems to overcome. And our program, I'm very proud to say that I inherited, um, had worked all these things out in the early years. So this is our first, um, this is a successful patient. Um, this is the earliest one we know of. It was in 1971, he had a motorcycle accident and his lungs were smashed up from that. This is the first successful ECMO patient in Santa Barbara. And as you can see, um, all the IV fluids coming out of glass bottles. My God, you know. And um, the ECMO machine itself is this weird, um, all I can think of, it looks like a keg. It looks like a wooden barrel down here. It's spinning the blood and sucking it in and pushing it out. And uh, this guy lived. He would not have lived otherwise. So this is ECMO today. Um, this is actually a few years ago. We have a patient here who is actually on ECMO. Her lungs are on bypass. She's walking around. She's getting stronger. Um, she's being fed through the nose. Uh, the ECMO is going in and out through her neck. And this is our ventilator. The bird ventilator is all in a little pelican case. Uh, and our staff are helping her around. As you can imagine, this is not someone you want to trip over their wires and tubings. Uh, they're all smiling, but everyone's sweating a little bit. So, um, so once again, 1985, bypass in a box, needed blood thinners, didn't need blood thinners. And then H1N1 really put us on the map because of necessity. We did so many runs. Uh, this is where most of the experience comes from in the last 12 years or so. Our transport team has been in a lot of places. Um, we've been to Western Idaho, uh, Northern California. We will go and procure patients um, from Alaska even. Um, a couple of years ago, I went on the first transport to Alaska. Um, for those who don't know, it's, it's similar to a transcontinental flight in a puddle jumper. Um, and we put someone on ECMO there and brought him back. And he went back home and, and went back to work and was functional. So uh, most of our patients come from the I-5 corridor, some are from Eastern Washington and Eastern Oregon, and a few along the coast. 
um, we've had probably about 180 ECMO transports. And there's Alaska. This is an example of one of our machines in the operating room. If you're thinking, I have no idea where any of these tubings go and come from, that's exactly right. It, it's very complex. And uh, even when we bring physicians in to see their patients on this, it helps, we have to trace the, the, where each one of these tubings goes and comes from. Um, and so this is one of uh, our team pictures. We take this technology on the road and this is looking out from the back of one of our ambulances. Um, we have here, Dr. Hill, he's the ECMO surgeon for that day. Uh, we have a numerous other staff we have nurses, we have respiratory techs. Um, I think in this photo, we have two nurses. This is the ambulance driver. Um, the guy on the bike is not part of the team, but I'm sure he's, uh, he's happy to be in the picture. Um, and so a lot of work goes just to safely load the patient and unload the patient. The process takes about at least 30 minutes. If you've uh, kept up with the news a few years ago, uh, it was in, um, I think Time Magazine, uh, in France, they have the service, and because Paris is a very packed city and people are having cardiac arrests, they bring ECMO to the patient. And this is a person who had cardiac arrest in the subway in Paris, and they are actually putting this person on bypass on the floor in the train station as the trains are coming and going. And you see this person's got a headlamp and they're working on a person. Gratefully, another person's blocking us, so we can't see what's going on. And here is the little ECMO machine. And um, this thing up here is the pump, and down there, there's actually a hand crank. So if you don't have power, you can hand crank someone on bypass. Um, not fun to do for several hours, but you can keep someone alive with a hand crank. So, all right. This is uh, one of our airplanes. Uh, we're in a consortium with the Life Flight Network. And this is our Pilatus uh, PC-12, and it takes us everywhere. This is the plane that we took to Alaska, and it fits six crew members, including the patient. There's no drink service. This is a picture of uh, us landing in Alaska. And this is what it looks like on the inside. It's not uh, roomy. This is our nurse sitting there charting vitals. The monitor's up here, and there is actually a patient underneath here. And the patient is a large person. So you can see the equipment dwarfs the person. We go everywhere and in all conditions. If the pilot says thumbs up, we go. So this is actually not Alaska. This is Medford, believe it or not. Um, we were just uh, coming out of the airplane in Medford. There is actually a patient in here. And don't worry, they have artificial warming to the circuit um, and we unload them from the side and we go to the ambulance and this is the chair that has to be removed from the airplane so that the patient can go in and come out traditionally our patients are um, are obese uh, unfortunately being obese puts you at risk for all kinds of lung failure and so we have things set up to accommodate that this door is very large and we have a lift system that we helped invent to do this um, I'm, I'm here on the left without a mask. This is pre-COVID. This is our life flight nurse, our physician's assistant who's been with the program for many, many years, our critical care nurse. And he is a perfusionist uh, who specializes in circulating blood outside the body. Um, this is our ECMO team. So we have two nurses per patient. We have perfusion. We have all these specialists, um, including palliative care. We really wanna treat people as a whole person and this is a life changing event, no matter what happens in the end. And so um, all these people are what makes, we have historically between 70 to 80% of people actually go home. Um, nationally, the data shows it's 59%. So we do quite well, depending on the year. COVID has been a challenge though. I think with COVID, um, only about 60 to 65% of people make it to go home. Um, but the reason we're successful is because this team's been working together for many, many years. I wish I could cram all of them into the ambulance, but I can't. So uh, just a quick slide on who could benefit from ECMO. Anything that can make your lungs fail from trauma to bad pneumonia, to drowning, uh, to overdose of drugs, to hypothermia, 
Um, those are all people who could potentially benefit from the ECMO. This is a picture of one of these VDR ventilators. It's very vintage looking. Look at the knobs. There's an oscillator down here, you know, it's an oscillator. This is called a servolator. This is called a percussionator. I mean, you could tell it was invented in a certain era, okay? This isn't being used on an actual baby. It's very gentle. And this is it being used on an adult. And yes, she is awake. Um, and all the readings and things like that there. Um, okay, on to what is ECMO? So this is the primary ECMO mode that we use for uh, lung failure patients or COVID patients. A team surgically connects the large vein in the groin with a, with a tube. And this tube is snaked up to almost where the heart is and it drains the blood out of the patient. This is the, the blue blood, the blood that needs oxygen. It goes to the machine, gets oxygen, gets the CO2 taken out. And it's there's another tube surgically implanted in the neck that sits just above the heart. And this oxygenated blood goes into the heart. And it's the heart's job to pump it to the lungs. And so that's what ECMO is. It bypasses the lungs. And in reality, it partially bypasses the lungs. It doesn't completely bypass the lungs. And so in a, in a uncomplicated case, you're just left with a small scar in the groin and a small scar in the neck, okay? This is essentially, think of this as oxygen coming in the IV. Um, the other type of ECMO is full cardiac ECMO. The vein is the same, we drain blood the same, but it goes back, the good blood goes back into an artery right in the groin and it shoots the good blood backwards, up, up your aorta and back up into the heart because the heart's not pumping in this case, we shoot it backwards and it feeds all the organs on the way up. It feeds the brain and the arms. Um, this is not the natural direction of blood flow. So if a person doesn't need this, we don't apply it. There are a lot of complications uh, involved in shooting someone's blood against the natural flow. So it does keep someone alive, but it's a temporary mode. Okay, and I'll move on. Uh, this is the way that ECMO is done if um, we have to open their chest and it is not pretty. Okay, this is a person sideways and their chest is actually open. The tubes are going in. Uh, gratefully, someone's packed it with gauze so you don't have to see everything and put a plastic wrap that's antibiotic coated on top called Ioban. And this is how we get them. You know, they come to the ICU this way and we have to get them better. Um, this is another way to do it where his chest has been sewn closed and we've been able to tunnel all these tubings through his abdomen so that he doesn't have an open chest exposed to the environment. That's not a good thing. In general, you don't wanna run around with a chest open. Uh, germs get inside and, and things like that. And there's not enough betadine or iodine in the world to clean that, okay? so. Um, this is how we do it now. This is a picture of someone's groin, okay? This is the part that I would cover with an oak leaf, okay? This is the belly button up here. I hope everyone can see my pointer. And these are the two, two cannulas. And if you can see, one has dark blood coming out of it. That's the blood we're draining. And one has bright blood going in. So that's the blood that's the good blood. And the machine is somewhere out of the picture. This other one with the bright blood, if you're very astute, coming out here and going down, not up. This is to feed the leg, because if you think about it, if I put this in the blood vessel to the leg, then where does the leg get its blood from? Well, the, it, we, we siphon off a little bit and we feed the leg this way. Otherwise, your leg dies and that's not good. Okay. This is another picture uh, sideways. The groin is up here. Our uh, medical oak leaf, this is a towel, and these are the two cannulas coming out, okay? Um, some other pictures of how to get blood to the leg if we otherwise can't. We can actually surgically open the ankle and put blood upward, up through the, uh, the, the artery behind the ankle bone, okay? Um, losing the leg is a major complication uh, with ECMO. So we try to avoid that whenever we can. This is an actual picture of a room. Things get really busy with ECMO. This is a complicated endeavor. I wanna focus, I wanna emphasize how much of a team effort this is. Um, 
this is a machine that filters um, uh, antibodies out of a person. This is a dialysis machine. This is our ECMO machine here. Okay, and the dialysis is 24 seven. It's not just for several hours. This is a brain monitor up here and our ventilator is back here. And if you look really carefully, the patient's elbow is visible. Um, the person is completely covered with equipment and staff have to get in here. So if you don't have good teamwork, if you don't know your team, you, you probably shouldn't do this. Um, in fact, the, the National Association for ECMO says that if you have a need for ECMO and you're not experienced in it, you should transfer the patient to another center. Uh, these people cannot um, take mistakes. So if you have even small errors in medicine, they sometimes suffer from it uh, in an irreversible way. So uh, again, the team approach. So here, here are some of the less palatable pictures. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll give a second for people to avert their eyes. This is a guy who fell from uh, a construction worker, who fell from height and broke everything in his body. Um, his bowels had to be opened up and his lungs didn't work. You see the ECMO coming out of his leg. He needed someone like Dr. Ackerman to fix numerous fractures in his body. They were life-threatening fractures. And he made it, went back to work actually. Um, but, uh, and this is another patient who had to have amputations. Um, the, the trauma team is here taking care of his lung or her lung. Um, I think this patient survived as well and went home. These are some of our ECMO patients um, right before they leave the hospital. Um, we have an annual reunion every year and last year it was canceled, but we actually had to book a larger venue. We have over a hundred people and they come and they tell their stories and it's amazing. This is one of those things that because of medical practice in America, patients don't meet other patients. Their families don't generally meet each other. This is a time for them to all get together and tell each other their stories and for us to hear their stories and to meet the people that uh, we've helped work on. And sometimes even patients who don't make it, their families come as well because they've essentially become part of our family at Emmanuel. Um, you can see this person actually um, has their kid on them and they're still on ECMO. Um, this person has their pet. I'm not sure that's with hospital policy, but I think it was okay in this case. Um, Emmanuel has some of the best popsicles in the world, I hear. And this is them. And if, you, if you're thinking, well, I, I can't tell who the patient is, that's exactly right. Um, the reason we do this is because it does give people back their lives. Uh, we do have some people who are a little weaker permanently, but the goal is to have someone go home. Um, we have people mainly go home and eventually get off oxygen and they go back to work. So, and they, and they come back and visit us like this guy. So, so our team of Transport ECMO consists of 90 specially trained nurses. That's what it takes to make this whole thing work. Day and night, some people get one nurse, some people get two. Um, we have about 30 respiratory techs that travel with us and take care of people's lungs. And we have eight physicians, um, six of whom, uh, I'm sorry, seven of whom actually will take call and join me in, in being called at night, uh, get on an ambulance, get on an airplane for who knows where and go to a place where a patient is so sick, they cannot be transported by regular means they have to be on something more than a ventilator. They've maxed out. And so we go there and we actually do the surgical procedure right there in their bed. These people are so sick, they can't even roll down the hallway for a CT scan. They can't be moved. Um, their oxygen levels will drop. And so we'll put them on the heart-lung machine and we'll bring them back to a manual where they spend over a month usually. So for COVID, um, it's been a challenge because in the beginning, we didn't really know how people got COVID exactly. Um, and so we got a group of volunteers together and uh, we treated like flu that was contagious. And I um, was able to, and I could have really used Rotarians, I think at this time, I drove around town to buy respirators um, that we thought were probably effective. And I was able to get enough respirators just in time for our first COVID patient. Um, who ended up surviving 
Uh, I think Legacy Health has a video of him walking out of the hospital. Um, and we bought a bunch of respirators, thankfully from Granger, um, is a industrial and medical supplier. They sold me a whole bunch of respirators. We passed them out and the team was fit tested and then off they went. And so we've been using these respirators for quite a while. Um, some of the higher end respirators in the hospital are too bulky to use in an ambulance. So we use the ones you see some of the uh, construction workers use. Uh, we try to be very, very uh, mindful of our hand hygiene, but we are in the ambulance uh, airplanes with these patients with COVID for several hours at a time, um, inches from their face uh, with the ventilator. Uh, the way a ventilator works is you can't seal that air. It's not healthy. So some of it has to escape. And so, um, you know, I think this group of people we work with are very, very special. And um, I have to say that uh, for them to do what they do, they don't have to do that. They can get other jobs in nursing and medicine that are much less intense. Um, but seeing these survivors, I mean, look at these people and meeting them in person is even more amazing. The sharing a buffet lunch with them and hearing their stories, uh, especially a patient that you've taken care of, you have one perspective and then they tell you a different perspective. It's amazing. So at, with that, I'm going to stop and pause on this slide. Um, you are welcome to email me with any questions. Uh, my mobile is yours to use. It's an iPhone, you can text me. Um, but if you text me, that means I'm allowed to text you back. So uh, patients get this number, patients get this email, so do our referring physicians. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you so much, Joseph. So if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand or just unmute um, and I'll call on you. Chris, you have a question. Um, I was just going to ask, I know that you do the adult program, um, but ECMO is also useful in the NICU. Um, how many, how, you know, you have the 300 plus or 400 so cases of adults, how many cases have been done at the same time in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit? A very, very small number. Um, between neonatal intensive care and pediatric intensive care, which uh, is a larger group, um, the number of ECMOs done per year is probably less than 10. It is because of the diseases that, um, that ECMO is used for for babies is much different than adults. And there are, um, historically there were two centers in town. So some of them go to Dornbecker and some of them go to Randalls. And thankfully these patients are few and far between with congenital heart disease that they're born with. We do help with some of the larger children who need ECMO. We'll go over to Randalls and put them on ECMO for the, for the physicians there because we have the experience to do the larger people. But small babies, when they get ECMO, we can't put it in the groin and the neck blood vessels. They're not big enough. They have to have their necks cut open and connected directly by a surgeon. Um, and then they have to be very carefully positioned every minute they're on it. You don't want those things to fall out. And so um, for babies, thankfully, the volume is much smaller and the program is different. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating. Um, are there other questions from anybody else? Well, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Reed. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and actually, before I, I move on, Carol, I'll give you a moment just to plug uh, the quick announcement that we had from Dan earlier. Carol's going to step in and give an announcement for that. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you, Reed. Uh, Reed. My name is Dan, and my announcement today is that we are seeking donations of water bottles for the uh, Blanchet House. Um, they fill up these water bottles, they make them nice cold water, and they hand them out to the homeless people that come by to get food and everything. So if you have, like we all do, have those water bottles that we get from conventions and other places that you're like, oh boy, another water bottle, then put them all in a bag and bring them to the meeting on August 6th and we will make sure they get to the right place. August 6th? I thought it was August 3rd. 
Oh. I think it is August 3rd. Oh, Same okay. Difference. We get the point though, Carol. Bring your August water bottles to a meeting. I have a question. Do those, those can be used water bottles, it sounds like, or do those need to be new? Yes, they can be used water bottles also. They will be um, disinfecting them. Okay, excellent. I have a couple of those I will certainly be bringing. Thank you, Carol, for that announcement. Next week, we will hear from the legendary Scott Burns on the Lake Ridge Rhyolite Boulder and the great mystery of how it got to Lake Oswego. Be sure to tune in to hear from one of the most riveting speakers in the world. Scott Burns is guaranteed to knock your socks off. Next week's meeting will once again be live via Zoom at noon on Tuesday. Don't forget the following week, as Carol just mentioned, the week of August 3rd, we are planning to meet back in person at the Sentinel. Pre-registration for the in-person meeting is required. Please visit our website for registration as it is likely to fill up. Beyond that, reach out to your friends and make sure they get registered as well. We don't want anybody to have to miss this excellent event. Remember, if you have a speaker idea, you can submit them on our website. Siobhan will put the link in the chat. Thank you so much, Siobhan. All right. I would like to thank Jim for your reflection this morning. I'd like to thank Carol for stepping in to introduce the donation drive for Dan, Maria for your event announcements, and to Chris for providing our speaker introduction today. And lastly, thank you so much, Joe. We appreciate you making the time for our club today. That was a fascinating presentation. I learned a ton about that. I thought it was really, really interesting. So thank you so much for taking the time. You did a great job with that presentation. Uh, you're welcome back anytime as a guest or maybe a future Rotarian. Please come back and join us another time. Thank you. And as we close today's meeting, let's all remember why we're here. We serve to change lives. Let's continue to focus on the lives that we change and continue to step up and to do the right thing. Thanks again to all of you for joining us today. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>